for some of us, something deep inside our heart is most at home in search of places we've never been. It's the part of us that senses a familiar feeling when we're staring into a campfire. It's the part of us that slowly wilts sitting behind a desk. I'm in my 70s now. One day we all have to decide for ourselves what it's like to be closer to the end than the beginning. I feel incredibly lucky, perhaps because I've never ended up too busy to live free. A long time ago, I was headed straight down that path. I was a commercial banker. Then one day I decided to stop making other people's dreams come true and focus on my own. I threw my business suits in the trash, became a guide, and with some help from a twist of fate, began filming fishing shows. When we first started, very few people had ever seen some of the things we filmed in the Everglades, the Florida Keys, the Bahamas, and around the world. It seems like a lifetime ago, and it seems like yesterday. It was a different world. We didn't have half the equipment that exists today. We had to invent things as we went along. And a lot of what we did wasn't possible with the boats of that time. So we made our own. Building a boat, like becoming a fisherman, is part technical stuff like dead rise, beam, draft, tackle, and understanding the water. But really, before it ever gets to any of that, it's about knowing where you want the boat to take you, where you want fishing to take you. Every time I get in a boat and push off, it's like I'm leaving all the troubles of the world behind. A boat can only give you that feeling of freedom if it does what you want it to. And there was a time when inshore boats that could run far and fish shallow were just a fantasy. Then in 1997, this vision of Hell's Bay's founders took shape. Once it was finished, a friend and I took it to Miami and then drove it to Bimini at night. No GPS, just a compass, the stars in the night sky, and three six-gallon tanks of gas. It's hard to believe that boats before 97 were so different from today, but this boat reinvented the possibilities of shallow water fishing. When I showed this boat to other guides for the first time, it was so different from the standards of the day, I almost got laughed out of the keys. But within 18 months, if you were in a serious keys tournament and you weren't fishing one of these boats, you were not in the tournament. Anglers were fishing places no one else could get to, running the kinds of trips that were once only doable with a few tricks of ingenuity, and even then, only with years of experience exploring a vast wilderness.
nameless keys scattered across Florida Bay's ocean of shallows. Remote shorelines of bites. Thin slicks of tide pulsing over treacherous mud banks and bars. And the no man's land of bays and coves behind Whitewater Bay, connected more often by false hope than by narrow passages of cricks and blind corners. Everglades National Park is a vast and demanding place to navigate. An unmarked graveyard spanning over a century of shipwreck and hurricane victims has been mapped across it. It's also a wonderful place full of stunning beauty. When I started out as a professional guide in 1980, there were only three or four of us venturing deep into the park. We often joined our brethren in the rituals of the better known hunting grounds out on Florida Bay. Finding your way across this horizon of islands without GPS was no small feat. But for myself and a few others who knew another secret, we would also leave these open flats and launch in the park to get to the skinny shallows where the really good fishing was. We used to take John boats as far into the back country as they would go to places where we had hidden canoes. It was the only way to get into that shallow maze. Even today, Making the run in a modern skiff, you get the idea of how a place way in the back like Hell's Bay started off, for me, as being not so much a fishing spot, but a mystery. Why did it have a name like Hell's Bay? What happened back there to cause it to be Hell's Bay? And then the rumors of the fishing that existed back there. But you can't go there because you'll never get out alive. It's one of those rare places that is mythical and yet very real. Those places hidden deep in the park like Hell's Bay were the urban legends of my childhood. I came to be a Florida native through the travel of immigrants. My grandparents came to the United States from Lithuania through Ellis Island, traveled down the coast in covered wagons, and then settled near present-day Miami. The place where I grew up was smack in the middle of Biscayne Bay, the Everglades, and the Keys. My constant companions were John Emery, Norman Duncan, and Chico Fernandez. We spent our youth learning the migratory patterns of wild game and exploring the mysterious estuaries and swirling tides of South Florida. to make push poles for our makeshift skiffs. We used to just go into the woods and cut down a guava tree. It was a wonderful way to grow up. By the mid 60s, I was in the army working as a linguist in Panama and fishing Central America. Then I came back to South Florida for my stint as a banker. When I finally came to my senses and returned to my roots as a guide, I fished the Keys, the Everglades, Central Florida, and spent late summers guiding in the Rockies. But on August 4th, 1992, Hurricane Andrew hit, and like thousands of other Floridians, I lost my home and all my worldly possessions. 
That's when, with the help of many friends, I found a new beginning filming television shows, starting with the Saltwater Angler, and then for over a decade filming the Walker's K Chronicles. After the hurricane, I also relocated, moving to Central Florida near the St. Johns River, another beautiful place that without the right kind of boat would be next to impossible to really explore. A good airboat and a well-designed skiff are so indispensable to the Florida experience that without them, for me, there would be no Florida. Even with today's carbon fiber push poles, I still prefer the contact of wood with the marl. And the fork shape just works better in all poling situations. So I never fail to replace the plastic with the real thing. The process is something I've gradually refined over the years by my own doing and by learning from others. Most of the tools we have in fishing today evolved that way. Most of the tools we have in fishing today also started out a lot like this, part craftsmanship and part jury rigging. A lot of what can be bought today, we used to have to dream up and make ourselves. I suppose tying flies is the most commonly reached touchstone of that resourceful spirit. But for my contemporaries, the necessities begging for invention were still wide open territory. Myself and friends developed horizontal under gunnel rod storage, outboard bait wells, polling platforms and push pull holders articulating bunks on boat trailers, drag line steel leading edges on outboard props, using trim tabs on skiffs, as well as outdoor carpet and fore and aft spray rails, Teflon drag systems and fishing reels, knots and fly patterns. Too many innovations to recall. But when I look back at how things have changed in my time, improvements to skiffs have been the most transformative for the sport. In the beginning, fishing the Florida Keys really was the end of the rainbow. A land of exotic flowers, azure waters, endless shallows and reefs. The overseas highway seemed almost impossible. This was the land of Zane Gray, Ernest Hemingway, and one of the first widely known guides, Jimmy Albright. In the 1940s, anglers pulled into Jimmy's house and he took them out towing a skiff behind his 30-foot cabin cruiser, the Rebel. By the 50s, 
Inshore power boats were less capable on the flats than Jimmy's skiff. In the 60s and 70s, there were some guys actually using runabouts. One of my mentors, Everglades pioneer Herman Lucerne, used a John boat to get in the back country. By 76, when Stu Apt filmed Tarpon Country with Herman and myself, skiffs had entered a phase with lots of dead rise, making them tippy, so the beams got wider and then they needed bigger motors. It was hell pulling these things. And in places where you could float a boat like that, you had to pull from the bow or stand on the outboard. There was no such thing as a polling platform. Eventually, I designed and built a number of custom one-offs before starting my first boat company, Wind River Skiffs. And I had a hand in a few other companies as well before co-founding Hell's Bay Boatworks. The skiffs that emerged in the 80s and 90s gradually improved. But when the first Hell's Bay was made in 97, the other skiffs still weighed so much they were drawing a foot of water or more. At our first boat show in Houston, we had our skiff floating in six inches of water. We handed out rulers so people could measure the few inches of draft for themselves. There'd never been anything like its combination of range and stealth. Hell's Bay didn't just build a skiff. Hell's Bay gave rise to a lifestyle and left in its wake a devoted fraternity of owners and would-be owners who share a dedication to a lifelong pursuit of fishing experiences. Today in Titusville, Florida, Hell's Bay Boatworks is making skiffs we couldn't even imagine in the day I guided my first trip. These boats are a completely unique combination of materials and engineering concepts from the aerospace industry, America's cup yacht racing, and the tradition of built-by-hand craftsmanship. These boats are literally built from the paint job up. The secret laboratory where these ideas are hatched has given rise to a litany of innovations that redefined technical polling skiffs. It's not only a fishing platform, it's the magic carpet that takes you to places that live in your mind while you're sitting at your desk and let you reach into your guts and be yourself. For me, Hell's Bay Boatworks, like Walker's K, is part of a life's work that I hope will always light the way to an appreciation of the wild places that live in all of our hearts and fantasies. <laughs> 